I'm the director of the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, and I'm joined today by Larissa Maxwell, who is the um, manager of the anti-human trafficking programs with the Salvation Army. So um, I'm really excited that uh, we're able to uh, connect with you via webinar today. And I'm just trying to get our PowerPoint loaded here. Just bear with me. Sorry, there's a little bit of a technical glitch here as we're getting going. Um, maybe as we're waiting, I just wanted to mention that uh, our presentation is geared as an introduction to the issue of human trafficking today, and it's mainly for frontline service providers. Uh, I know many of you um, are, are branch-funded programs, Victim Services and Violence Against Women, uh, but I believe we have... Um, others as well from uh, other ministries and other social service agencies, so we welcome everybody um, today. If we could just get our PowerPoint loaded, we would be off and on our way here. Okay, we're just going to pause here for a minute while we try to load. This is our uh, computer is still loading my PowerPoint. I'm not sure. Apparently others can see it, but I can't see it. the presentation so I'm just going to um, hope that this works uh, while we wait for uh, our screen to come up um, and Steve is going to uh, move the slides along for us so uh, so as I mentioned we are joined by uh, Larissa Maxwell uh, today and uh, very excited uh, Larissa runs a program uh, called Deborah's Gate which provides services to trafficked women uh, right around BC and in fact across Canada so she has a lot of experience in this issue and we're very pleased that she's able to join us. Hi Larissa. Hi Ron. Hello everyone. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for coming today. Okay the next slide um, who we are. Uh, the Office to Combat Trafficking in Person is part of the Ministry of Justice and we are part of the Community Safety and Crime Prevention Branch so our uh, branch uh, funds victim service programs, as I mentioned, violence against women programs. Uh, we run the crime victim assistance program and the victim safety unit and other uh, court support services as well. So our office is, uh, is, is right within uh, this branch and we are connected to victim services right across uh, BC. The third slide, uh, please Steve. Um, just uh, speaks to the fact that we opened in July 2007 and our role is to coordinate BC's strategy to address human trafficking and that's human trafficking in all its forms, sexual exploitation, labor trafficking and domestic servitude. So the next uh, slide speaks to the goals of our presentation today. So by the end of the presentation, we hope you will have learned the definition and indicators of human trafficking, how to protect and support a trafficked person, services and resources available in British Columbia, 
links to the online training course that OCTIP has developed and uh, recently updated so that you can learn more about human trafficking. And uh, we want to give you a referral method to Deborah's Gate. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a unique shelter for trafficked women, uh, and it does accept referrals from anywhere in British Columbia. And uh, so uh, I'll just turn it over to Larissa to speak a little bit more about Deborah's Gate. And we're on to slide five now. Great. So Deborah's Gate is a very unique program, the only one of its kind in all of Canada. It was opened in 2009, and it's a national specialized program of care that is located in Vancouver in an undisclosed location. Um, and it serves international and domestic women uh, age 18 and up who have been trafficked in situations of sexual and labor exploitation and who are in need of protective and restorative housing and healing. We actually have the highest security out of any facility in Canada, so we have worked with some of the most complex cases. We've also worked with some that don't need such a high level of security. Um, there have been some instances where we have accepted trafficked minors, but that's in partnership with MCFD if we're the most appropriate place for them. Um, since we started in 2009, we've worked with over 75 survivors in our residential program. We've actually worked with hundreds of individuals through some of our outreach services, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, just to give you a sense of what Deborah's Gate is like, uh, it's very confidential and has a high level of security. Um, there's private rooms for up to 10 women at a time. So per, per year, we take around 20 individuals. And there's no set amount of time that they're in our program. So it's really based on the individual, working with them, and what their goals are in terms of rehabilitation. You can see from the slide, we've got some things listed there. We have wraparound rehabilitation from a psychosocial approach that's trauma-informed. Uh, we do individualized care plans, um, we have internal trauma counseling, and then we also have some uh, creative therapies. You'll see art, uh, pet, and physical therapy, um, and then some outreach services. So we'll go to the next slide, Steve, slide six, and we'll just take a look at two of our unique programs within Deborah's Gate. Um, the first one is Living Hope Life and Living Skills Program. Um, this is a program that uh, we started just last year, and it's a life and living skills program designed specifically for survivors of human trafficking um, to provide key life and living skill development. Um, and the goal is that uh, residents participate in personal development classes and activities. Um, and those are including things like healthy relationships, sleep hygiene, art therapy and fine arts, um, nutrition, cooking, um, stress and anxiety management, journaling, employment, and many other things. We also have another program, and this is a unique one that we started as well um, just in the last year, uh, that's called New Hope National Outreach Services. What we were finding is that we were having a lot of referrals to our program from across Canada, but the individuals being referred maybe didn't want to come to our program. Maybe they weren't ready yet, and they needed to access something like detox or another program first, or maybe it wasn't safe for them to come to Vancouver. And so this program was launched to be able to provide assistance to a traffic person anywhere in Canada to connect them to essential resources and support. They could be a woman, a man, a family, a transgender individual, a child, it doesn't matter. We'll provide services for them and work with our partners in different provinces to connect them to safe support. Sometimes that means they enter the Deborah's Gate program um, residentially, but sometimes it doesn't. And so on a, on a typical average, we work with between 150 to 300 um, persons per year through our outreach program. Um, one of the things I'll just share with you is um, just a bit of a survivor testimony. This is slide seven, Steve. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, one of our current residents, we changed her name here, and she's given permission for us to share this, but we've removed any details just to protect her confidentiality. This is her um, experience of what, it, what it's been like for her at Deborah's Gate. She mentioned, Deborah's Gate has saved me. After the traumatizing events, I felt hopeless. It's funny how falling in love and trying your best to make someone happy I began to fall out of love with myself. I accepted the disrespect because I thought I deserved it. I was empty before I came to Deborah's Gate. Um, being here in a safe and warm environment, I feel like I can be my old self again. I really appreciate that the staff are here for you 24 hours a day. They have been the light that makes my darkness go away. So that's just to give you a bit of a sense of what does the journey look like for someone who enters our program. And this is a resident who's been with us for quite a few months and accessing many different rehabilitative supports. That's wonderful. Thanks, Theresa. Um, we wanted to just uh, move to a poll question, uh, our first one, Steve, and that is how many 
of you are aware, uh, were aware of Deborah's Gate uh, Shelter for Trafficked Women and its province-wide mandate before today. And if you could just um, click on your, uh, there's options I believe that um, you have to uh, answer these questions if you're on the um, on the, the link page. Just um, hi, I'm Rezachita. I'm not on the link page, so I'm just watching the, the PDF. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I think I have not known about Deborah's case until today. Oh. I'm from Immigrant Services Society, by the way, in Vancouver. Well, that's great. We're glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it's really interesting to know about this, but I didn't know about this yeah, until today. Okay, um, thank you for your comment. Uh, we just uh, checked in with Steve on the uh, poll question, and apparently about 85% of you did not know about Deborah's Gate before today, so uh, we're very pleased that you were able to join us and find out some more. Uh, Steve, could we move to the next slide, please? What is human trafficking? Uh, basically, human trafficking, um, as, as many of you probably know, really involves the um, control of someone by, um, by violence, coercion, and deceit for the purpose of exploitation. And that's where human trafficking is, is quite different from other crimes. Uh, there needs to be control of a person uh, through some means to um, the end goal of, of exploitation, either labor exploitation or sexual exploitation. Uh, we work under the UN Protocol on Trafficking in Persons. This is a protocol at the international level that Canada signed on to in 2002, and it provides a definition of human trafficking that all countries have agreed to. And certainly in British Columbia, at the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, and, uh, and throughout Canada, this, um, this is a real uh, guideline for us in terms of how to approach the issue. Um, there is uh, a distinction between domestic human trafficking and international trafficking. Domestic trafficking uh, really includes um, trafficking that happens in Canada. Uh, so all of the elements have to happen in Canada, uh, whereas international trafficking deals more with uh, those that are trafficked across a, a border, a, a country's border. So that's that's the kind of the basic difference there. Uh, so the next slide, number 10, um, looks at uh, the difference between smuggling and trafficking. And this is often something that's confused um, with, uh, with the public, and it's important to understand the distinction, smuggling and trafficking are very different. Um, in a smuggling situation, once at their destination, the smuggled persons are free to go. So they've usually paid a certain amount to the uh, smuggler to get across the border. Once they arrive in the new country, they're free to go. In a trafficking situation, that's not what happens. Uh, once at their destination, the trafficked persons are exploited. Often they owe a large debt to the trafficker and uh, they are exploited for their labor or sexual services uh, to repay the debt uh, or um, you know, for, uh, for, for other travel expenses that, that, uh, that they may have incurred. The next slide, uh, the definition of human trafficking is provided there for you. Um, in 2005, Canada amended its criminal code to include a specific offense around human trafficking. And it is a serious offense in both the Criminal Code and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So the definition you see on the slide um, is the Criminal Code definition. And uh, essentially, um, you need one act uh, by a means for a purpose. So uh, somebody who recruits one uh, another uh, through the use of uh, threats or force for the purpose of sexual exploitation, that would be considered uh, an offense, uh, a human trafficking offense, or if someone um, exercises control, direction, or influence over someone's movements for the purpose of labor trafficking and has used deception or abused their position of trust or authority, that uh, could be considered human trafficking. So, um, so the, um, the, the definition uh, includes quite a few different elements. 
On the next slide, uh, we've just provided a little bit more definition in the criminal code of how um, the criminal code looks at this exploitation element. Uh, generally, there has to be exploitation, either labor or sexual services, um, in order for it to be human trafficking. This uh, part of the criminal code also requires um, an element of fear. So there, there has to be, in all the circumstances, um, some uh, sense that, that the person being trafficked fears for their safety or the safety of another. And this propels them to provide their labor or services. And of course, traffickers use many different means to create a climate of fear, uh, keeping control over the traffic person in, in a variety of ways. And we'll look at a couple of cases as we move forward here. So if we could just go to our next poll question, Steve, and that is, uh, were you aware of the criminal code definition of human trafficking prior to this presentation? We'd just like to get a quick uh, sense from you about whether or not um, you had uh, learned about this uh, definition of, of uh, human trafficking in the criminal code prior to today. And I'll just check with Steve. <laughs> Okay, it's looking like about 50-50 uh, uh, on this question, so uh, so that's exciting. We've got some um, people that are learning this for the first time, and others of you that, uh, that were aware of this. That's great. Uh, any questions at this point from you on, uh, on the phone or uh, on the, uh, the link page? Uh, any questions about this definition before we uh, move forward? The next part will be on human trafficking trends and dynamics. And uh, we'll certainly have some, uh, some more time for questions as well as we go forward. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Resetita from Indian Services Society. I wanted to reserve my question at the end because I would be interested in labor trafficking. Okay. Like how does that really work? Because um, I'm, I'm a Filipino settlement worker and um, I, I talk with a number of temporary foreign workers and I don't know how that would be, you know, like, uh, is, is it part of, uh, of the trafficking um, uh, mandate that mm -hmm. uh, OCTIP or OCTIP would be um, is talking about? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it says uh, labor trafficking, so how does that look like? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to, uh, in just a couple of minutes, actually walk you through a labor trafficking case mm -hmm. that came forward in, uh, in British Columbia. So hopefully that will give you a little bit more of a concrete idea of what, of what labor trafficking is. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions at this point? Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll move on, and as I said, there will be some uh, further opportunities for questions. So I'll just ask uh, Larissa to uh, address the next couple of slides for us. So we're on slide 14 now, Steve. Great. So we're on the slide. This is Human Trafficking in Canada, Trends and Dynamics. So as Rob mentioned at the beginning, um, this is an introductory session, so uh, we're not able to cover every detail, but I want to give some of the general circumstances to give you a sense of what are we seeing in BC and what are we seeing in Canada. So when it comes to victims, what we're seeing is perpetrators identifying and targeting unmet needs. That's probably the most important thing to understand because it could apply to anyone. Um, there are particular populations that are at risk in different ways, but in terms of unmet needs, that's something that can go across the board. And perpetrators are very skilled in identifying what those unmet needs are. Um, we also see individuals who have addictions um, or vulnerabilities. Uh, typically, how they're recruited uh, would be with false promises, sometimes with material goods or gifts, um, sometimes uh, giving basic needs, things like housing or employment. Um, and the control starts to come in, and it can include things like isolation, uh, constant movement, extreme violence, uh, forced addiction, um, threats towards their family, which are very real threats, um, forced abortion, shame, blackmail. Um, we've seen threats of law enforcement, especially if they're a foreign national. And then they're being gang control as well. So those are some of the dynamics that we see that are contributing to um, some of the victimization of this population. But in terms of the other end, what do the perpetrators look like? 
Well, the answer is all across the board. Um, perpetrators can be pimps. They can be husbands, uh, boyfriends, family members, uh, gang members. We've seen females um, or other types of recruiters. We've also seen organized crime leaders. So that's where human trafficking is very complex because the cases can look very different depending on the different factors. Um, often the perpetrator is known to the victim. They're not usually a complete stranger, and they often start off incredibly friendly and charming and kind. Um, eventually, as the control starts to come in, they maintain a trauma bond on their victims. And I'm going to share a testimony later from a, a resident of ours that kind of gives you a sense of what that trauma bond looks like. Um, and usually the perpetrators are highly manipulative and dangerous. Um, so that's one of the important things to note in that. We'll move on to uh, slide number 15. I'd like to go over our first case study that's from here in BC. This might be familiar with you. It's uh, Crown versus Reza Moazami. This was recently in the papers for the last year, so it might ring some bells for you. So this was a project that the Vancouver Police Department, an investigation they were doing called Project Saber. And they arrested Moazami in 2011, and uh, he was charged with 36 counts. What essentially happened in this case, and we work very closely with the Vancouver Police Department, so this information is um, verified by them, uh, one key victim came forward, um, and then the floodgate opened. Um, up to 25 potential victims were identified, and 11 eventually testified in federal court. Um, all were domestic girls from Canada, born and raised in Canada, except for two of them. Um, one of the tactics that Moazami used, among many, is that he would provide pets to his victims, and then he used it as leverage for compliance. So these were young women, um, and what he would do is give them a pet, and if they didn't do what he asked, he would harm that animal. So you can imagine that's very powerful leverage, especially for a young woman. Um, what are some of the demographics of the victims, just so you get a sense? Um, most were sexually exploited children who were still minors. So the majority were under the age of 18 when this was happening, when they were being sold for sex. Um, many were addicted, had previous addictions, or were forced addicted once under his control. Um, some were facing unplanned pregnancy or experienced forced abortions. Um, most were homeless or at risk of being homeless. Um, some displayed developmental delays, and those were things that Moazami targeted them for. A few others were runaways or dropouts from school um, or victims of violence whether that be by Moazami or by others. And just to give you a sense, some of that violence included things like tasering, um, blunt force, um, strangulation, and drug-facilitated sexual assault. Um, the great news is that um, Reza Moazami was convicted on 30 counts, including human trafficking, in 2014, and we're awaiting sentencing for him um, in 2015. So we're not sure how much time he'll be serving, um, so that'll be coming out probably later this year. And uh, maybe I can just add that that was uh, our first conviction in British Columbia under the criminal code for uh, human trafficking. So um, exciting for, uh, for our, our developments here in BC. Absolutely. The next case study I want to go over um, is another one from here in BC, Crown versus Franco Orr. So just to give you a sense of uh, what happened in this circumstance, a young mother from the Philippines took a job working for the Orr family in Hong Kong as a domestic caregiver. Uh, while in Hong Kong, the working conditions were standard as per what was common in Hong Kong. When um, she was brought to Canada, the family invited her to join them um, and arranged for a visitor's visa. So first of all, an incorrect visa since she would be working. Um, upon arrival, she was working seven days a week, 16 hours a day without being paid. Um, some of the conditions that began to happen for her was that she was not allowed to engage with the public or go out alone. Specifically, was forbidden not to speak with Philippine women or Philippine people in general, um, so wasn't allowed to make any community connections, was verbally and physically humiliated by the family regularly. Um, the employer kept her ID, so she had no control over her essential ID, um, and no private living quarters and no days off. So what we see essentially here is the elements of slavery. Um, when this, again, was a Vancouver Police Department uh, investigation of the counter-exploitation unit, um, they investigated this case, and um, Franco Orr was convicted of human trafficking under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act in 2013. Just an important um, note, this is currently being appealed, um, but that was the decision in 2013. I'd like to move to slide 17 just to give you a sense of what um, trauma bonding can look like. 
So one of our residents, um, and again, her name has been changed, and the details have also been changed to protect her confidentiality, but she gives her full consent to share this today, as it's exciting for her to educate others um, as she's processing her own rehabilitation. Um, this is what she described it was like for her, and in her case, it was a case of sexual human trafficking. She stated that when it was happening, I was addicted to my trafficker, like an emotional dependency. Every time he left the room, I felt that I was having an anxiety attack and my chest felt like it would collapse. When I was working, meaning when she's being sexually exploited, he left me alone. But when I wasn't working and he left to go to a friend's house or to see another girl, I felt so messed up and that I needed him. At first, when he was exploiting me, he was always there for me. I didn't have that when I was growing up, and he made me feel he was stable and that I could rely on him. But when we got in arguments or fights, I would be scared that he would never come back. Then I felt I would have nothing. A lot of the girls who work feel this way about their trafficker. I would sit there and wonder I, why I'd be crying if he went to the corner store. I felt messed up inside. And so for her in describing this, there's an important line there when she says that I didn't have that growing up. I didn't have someone stable. And he identified that core need in her that she didn't have and exploited that eventually. And that's an important piece to understand. In this case for her as well, um, she didn't love him. She actually had a lot of features towards him, but this bond was very strong and was facilitated by violence. So that just gives you a sense of what is happening for some of the victims who are under the control of a trafficker. And I think we're talking about uh, obviously very vulnerable um, victims and, uh, and traffic persons uh, are um, you know, extremely vulnerable to, uh, to these tactics. And, uh, and so th those are some of the things to, uh, to kind of look for, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the, uh, the indicators as well um, in, in the next slide. So if we could go to the next slide, uh, please, Steve. And this is uh, warning signs and indicators for sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And we've got um, quite a long list here on the, uh, on the slide. And, and I can say that in uh, the OCTIP online training, there's also a good set of indicators that you can actually print off and keep uh, by your desk if, if that would be of assistance. Uh, so just um, some of them uh, related to sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. Uh, one thing that um, I, I believe the RCMP and other police uh, have noted, and, and certainly um, you've noticed this as well with the, uh, with the residents that you have, Larissa, is evidence of malnourishment and, and sleep deprivation. Uh, so in, um, in a sex trafficking or a sexual exploitation case, uh, many of these women are being asked uh, or forced to uh, work uh, extremely long hours, service many men in a night or in a 24-hour in a period, in fact. Uh, they may have to sleep where they're uh, working, and uh, they are not fed well, generally, and, uh, and, and in uh, labor trafficking cases, uh, we also have seen women being forced to eat table scraps. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, an, an indicator that you should be aware about. Um, having a phone that's constantly ringing, this is another method, very common method of control by traffickers, is to give the, the women a phone and they're constantly being monitored through their, their phone. Uh, they're being text or phone uh, phone calls constantly, just keeping uh, a check on exactly where they are, what they're doing at all times. Um, these women may not be aware of their own schedule. They may not have um, time to meet their own regular commitments. And in one of the very first cases that we talk about in the online training, uh, the Nekpangi case, um, this young woman was sexually exploited. Uh, by a trafficker, and she uh, was refused to um, attend school. And she was quite young. She was 16, I believe. And so at the end, uh, when she was um, rescued and she ex
Okay, folks, uh, we're just uh, doing a little computer change here. So Roz and Larissa are coming into my office, and they're going to take the presentation from here. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience on this. So as I was mentioning, this idea of flashy belongings, so purses, clothing, and jewelry, we've seen this a lot where residents have come into our program, and they have a suitcase full of Prada purses or iPads, but they actually have nothing essential in terms of they're not able to purchase their own food, they don't have feminine hygiene products. This is a big warning sign to look for. Another one is tattoo branding. This is often of a name that's not theirs, or it's a degrading nickname that's on their neck or their wrist, their chest, or their lower back. So we've seen the name of traffickers, actually put on their body, but we've also seen nicknames um, either of those traffickers or other phrases that are very degrading that are actually put on their bodies, and that's meant to be a communication to everyone else that they are under the control of a certain trafficker. Another important one is unexplainable injuries. So things like strangulation, broken teeth. Broken teeth is really important because um, that's when there's been a lot of trauma to the face. Um, bite marks, cigarette burns, um, intentional knife lacerations. And another important one is bruising from the neck down, um, especially when it comes to sex trafficking. That's something that happens that they don't want there to be any marks on their face, but there would be from the neck down. And then ongoing reproductive health issues, um, which would be a natural um, challenge uh, from what they are experiencing. I'm going to slip to the next slide here. Um, so I want to talk a bit about some of the warning signs and indicators for domestic servitude and labor trafficking. And I want to say, first of all, that sometimes it can be a combination of both um, sex trafficking and labor. So these are just some indicators to look for, but there's also many more. So we just wanted to kind of give a start today. Um, so one of the things that we want to look for is working excessively long or unusual hours and there's no breaks. Um, there isn't a defined job description and wherever they're working is dangerous. There's no safety equipment, no workplace hazard training, like the whole situation situation just does not seem like a professional job opportunity. They might be confined to a home or workplace and they're required to live on site and that living arrangement often isn't private. So there isn't a private room with a lock. They're often in a common area which is under the control of that trafficker. They're not free to come and go and they don't have access to food or control over meals. Um, as Roz mentioned earlier, there can be a large debt um, that they're unable to pay off no matter how much they work. Uh, the debt just keeps growing and keeps being added. Um, one thing that we saw in the Orr case is not being allowed to engage with the public, um, family, or build any community. So again, connecting to anyone who would be able to help them, the trafficker would uh, ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, another piece that I would say is they have few personal possessions and they're not allowed to speak for themselves when they're in public. And lastly, we just see no control over personal finances or essential ID. Not every one of these signs may be there, but if any of them are, it's definitely a warning sign for us to pay attention to. Um, so the next slide that we want to go to um, is unique um, factors that affect uh, foreign nationals. Um, so this is an important piece. Um, one of the things that we've seen is if there's cultural norms from their originating country that has facilitated exploitive practices, this can be one of the factors. So for example, gender-based violence or things like female genital mutilation or arranged marriage. Um, and when I say arranged marriage, I mean forced uh, arranged marriage and um, child and youth exploitation. So those can be challenges if it's already something from the community that they came from. Um, there can be shame in their experience, their orientation, and even even for asking for help, especially being in a new country and not really being aware of what rights they have in Canada, what supports are available. There's often a confusion between the difference of appeasement and consent. And you know, for most of the workers on the line, I'm sure this is something that you've seen a lot in other cases where consent is when you have multiple viable options to choose from and you have full agency to make that decision. Appeasement is when you're really given two options to do what they say or you're going to experience harm. And so when you choose to do what they say, it can feel like you've made a choice to consent, but it's not. It's appeasement that is self-protective so that you're not getting harmed. And that can be really confusing, especially for foreign nationals, where they might feel like they had a say in what happened to them, which is not the case. Um, there could be a lack of communication tools or even language to truly identify what has happened. Especially with foreign nationals, you're, we don't see them saying, I've been trafficked. Usually they don't even know what that is. Um, they just know that something has happened and there's been a level of control. Um, there could be a distrust of law enforcement, especially from the country they originated from. If it's not safe to report to law enforcement, they may feel they don't want to do that here. 
Um, they also may have a lack of tools to gain some kind of temporary or permanent residency in Canada to recover. So that can be a fear for them in coming forward if they don't have status here or if one of their visas, say, has expired and CBSA has issued a voluntary deportation order. Um, you can see some of the other points that down there as well. The one I just want to highlight is absolutely no Canadian supports or social contacts beside the trafficker. So you can see how isolating that would be for a person when the only information they're getting is from that trafficker who might say to them, if you speak up, you'll be deported, you'll be put in jail, they'll kill you. And if that person doesn't know that that's not the case in Canada or that there's other options for advocacy and support, they're going to believe that and that can keep them in the situation for a long time. Okay, thanks, Larissa. I just wanted to mention as well that there are um, specific factors related to uh, the um, vulnerability of Aboriginal communities uh, to human trafficking, and we haven't um, created a slide for this, but uh, but but due to the impacts of colonization, racism, residential school abuse, um, the fractured families that many Aboriginal communities um, experience, uh, we have found in British Columbia in particular and in the, uh, the Western provinces that Aboriginal women and girls are uniquely vulnerable because of all of these factors to human trafficking. And so I, w I really wanted to make that point. And uh, our office has been working uh, very closely with communities in Prince Rupert, Prince George, uh, Williams Lake, uh, Quinell, and a couple of, um, of uh, communities um, uh, of First Nations themselves, the Soto First Nation and in, in around Chetwin and the Nishka Nation uh, in, uh, in Northwest BC, um, specifically to try to, to deal with these issues and to start that conversation in communities about uh, the sexual exploitation of youth, uh, of, of their Aboriginal youth. And, uh, and so that's a really important um, point we wanted to, uh, to raise with you today as well. And then we've got another poll question for you. Do you think that you might have provided services to a traffic person in the past? Uh, often what we find after we do these presentations is people um, Oops, kind of realize that uh, there, um, there have been situations of trafficking that may not have been recognized. And, uh, and so we're just having a look at our poll results here. Um, it looks like, yeah, there's, there's some that have uh, definitely provided services. Uh, many of you are not sure, and that's very um, typical, and that's, that's okay. It is difficult to... Uh, com concretely identify whether or not a person has been trafficked or not. That's why we talk so much about indicators. Uh, it's even difficult for Larissa and I to, um, you know, completely confirm that a person has been trafficked because they don't, you know, identify themselves. They're not saying to us, I'm a trafficked person. Uh, so we really have to uh, take our time, listen to uh, these stories, support people with a lot of uh, care and, and, you know, eventually the, the, uh, the control and the stories do come out. Um, so I hope this uh, session today will give you some more uh, information and supports around um, helping you to identify traffic persons and uh, provide them with, uh, with support. So yeah, it looks like um, we're going to move to our next slide here. And that is the... Um, the part now we're going to talk about is, is a little bit more switching now to services and supports. And we haven't um, provided a great deal of information here, but, but one of the most essential things for you to take away from this webinar is uh, using a human rights approach. And uh, our office, uh, this is our service model. This is the model of services that we've developed in, in many communities, including those communities I just listed in uh, the north and central part of BC, as well as uh, here in Vancouver and Victoria. Uh, we're working with um, Abbotsford and 100 
Hundred Mile House, as well as Courtney and Comox in the, in this upcoming year to uh, develop a service model that that uh, looks like this in each community. And so what we found is that traffic persons may require culturally sensitive uh, services. It could be translation and interpretation services for those that are foreign nationals. Housing and shelter is an extremely uh, important service, and that's why uh, we've been so uh, lucky to have Deborah's Gate uh, and Larissa with us today. Um, and uh, emergency health and dental, of course, is extremely important. We have a group of nurses in the Fraser Health Authority now that have trained uh, all of the emergency personnel at the Surrey Memorial Hospital and uh, right throughout the Fraser Health Authority to recognize signs of human trafficking. Uh, counseling and support services, there is um, support through our Crime Victim Assistance Program for trafficked persons to receive counseling and of course there's excellent counseling provided through Deborah's Gate and legal consultation as well, especially for those that are foreign nationals and their status in Canada may be in jeopardy. This is extremely um, tricky uh, territory and, and really requires uh, legal consultation. So our work has been to try to build this network of services in each uh, community and of course connecting with police and Crown and victim services and other government agencies such as um, CIC, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, which provides the uh, temporary residence permit for uh, traffic persons as well as an agency such as um, WorkSafe BC if there are uh, issues uh, related to the um, safety of a workplace that a traffic person uh, is working uh, or being, you know, exploited in, uh, as well as employment standards. That's one of the agencies that uh, a traffic person can apply to to uh, get some um, of the money back that, that the trafficker uh, hasn't paid them. So that's our service model. Um, the, 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 the essence of a human rights approach is really to give back control to the traffic person. Do not make decisions for the traffic person. They have had their lives co extremely controlled. Their decisions have all been made for them. These are some of the steps in a human rights approach that uh, we believe uh, are really essential. Uh, you need time to build trust, uh, providing food or um, you know very basic necessities at first to build that trust is really important. And do no harm. Uh, often we are um, wanting to rush in to provide uh, services or supports that we really may not be able to deliver on. Uh, you may not be able to get them away from that trafficker without, um, you know, some some real uh, serious consideration for their safety. So, do no harm is another principle of the human rights approach, and deliver on your promises, and don't promise what you can't deliver. <laughs> Uh, so those are some of the elements that we hope you'll take away from the human rights approach. I'm just going to turn it back to, to uh, Larissa for um, the referral process to Deborah's Gate, and then we'll just uh, wrap up with uh, some resources for you. That's great. Thank you, Roz. And I, I can't uh, say enough how much I would promote the human rights-centered approach that's trauma-informed and culturally sensitive with this population when they have been uh, controlled to the level that they have. Uh, often when you're working with them, their lives are out of control, especially if the trafficker's not there anymore or they're not under that control. Um, and so it can, there's this desire to just help them and we often just want to take over their whole case and kind of almost become a control again because for them it's so out of control. And it is a bit of a painful process to give them back that control and to work with them and help them fill out a daytimer for the first time themselves to decide on a service, even though that might be a, a challenge for them to do if they haven't made decisions in a long time. It's a really important piece. Otherwise, we become the replacement trafficker in a sense because we are controlling um, and they were very willing to submit to that control. And so it's something for us to be aware of as service providers. Um, in terms of referrals to our program, it's important to know we no, accept... We we accept a 18 and out. 18 and out. Oh, hold on. Oh, There's hold a reflection. There's an echo. Does someone have their microphone enabled? Enabled. 
Let's just see. Oh, there we go. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for your patience. So we accept individuals age 18 and up, but if you are working with someone who's under that age, please do give us a call, and we'll assess whether we may be the best place for them. Otherwise, we will connect you to outreach services um, through our program to find a place for them. Um, age 18 and up, and there needs to be some level of exploitation happening, be that sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, or a combination of the two. Um, doesn't have to be defined necessarily as human trafficking, and police do not have to be involved. We, of course, encourage that, but no one in our program is required to work with police. Um, they are welcome to be in our program without that. Um, and uh, there needs to be some level of danger that they're fleeing, whether that's unknown or known. So there needs to be a reason that they need to be in a high-security safe house. Um, otherwise, it'll be very difficult for them to be in our program. They don't need those measures um, of safety and support. Um, and um, that uh, they also are voluntary, that they want to come to our program, that there is a desire whether that may be just a small desire at first to rehabilitate, to start to work on what's happened and to look forward to next steps of community reintegration. So how to make a referral is you just call our general phone line, 604-915-5678, um, um, to discuss criteria and availability. Um, if you go to our website, debrasgate.ca, we also have a toll-free phone number. So for those of you who are not in the lower mainland um, and may not have a lot of budget for long-distance calls, you can use a toll-free number to call. Um, and so to, the best thing is to call our staff before we fill out a referral form, just to discuss the situation and our criteria and our availability as well, to save you the time from filling out the form. Um, if they don't meet our program criteria, we will refer you to our outreach services for follow-up support to connect, okay, what supports would be good for them, what can we recommend, what can we make a connection for. If they do make the, meet the criteria for our residential program, we'll send you a referral form, and then you can send it back to us by email or fax. Um, and that's something that the agency fills out. The other, um, the victim may be a part of it, but it's really important that the agency fills it out, um, just also to limit um, some of the trauma for that individual in resharing that experience over and over. Um, upon acceptance, um, you guys would connect with us to arrange transportation. Sometimes we're able to do that. Sometimes we meet you in the middle. We kind of just figure out what works for everyone and um, provide some liaising support when needed for us to assist this person. And then lastly, once they're in our program, if you're able to provide some occasional phone support to that survivor, it means a lot to them. We're happy to take on their case and to work with them on a holistic um, model in, in every area of their needs, but it's huge for them to maintain connection with those who have even made that referral um, because often they have very few supports in their life. So we usually recommend a phone call every few weeks is really, really appreciated. There's a question, I think. No, maybe not. <laughs> I thought I heard uh, a question. Um, I just wanted to move uh, to our next slide here, which we'll do. Great. And that is um, to connect you with our online training course. Human trafficking in Canada is not immune. This is uh, a, a training that OCTIP uh, prepared and created with over uh, 60 organizations uh, providing us with uh, information and um, stories. In fact, uh, the second edition was launched in April last year, and it contains a number of stories of trafficked persons, uh, real situations that happened uh, here in BC and Canada. And so this training is available online. It's free. It's available at any time that you want to take it. You can um, go back and forth and refer to different modules as well. Well, so I just wanted to make sure that you uh, were aware of that. And I think we have a quick poll question about uh, whether or not you've completed the online training course uh, for service providers on human trafficking. Oh, fantastic. Okay, we're just getting the results coming in. So it looks like most of you have not. Uh, yet completed OC Tips online training course. Some of you have, which is great. Uh, it is um, available, as I say, right off our website, and uh, the link is provided uh, further on in the presentation. So, um, uh, I guess that's uh, you know really what we wanted to uh, provide for you today. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, at the very end of the PowerPoint, we have some uh, BC contacts. Uh, in addition to uh, the Deborah's Gate contact. Uh, so our office um, trains the VictimLink staff 
at this uh, 188 line. Victim Link answers it, but we train them uh, every year to um, understand the indicators of human trafficking and make appropriate referrals. So that's a province-wide service. We have an excellent RCMP human trafficking coordinator named Jazzy Bindra, who uh, works with police and uh, with community service agencies providing education and investigation related to human trafficking, so that's a fabulous resource. And uh, the Vancouver Police Department Counter Exploitation Unit has also provided uh, really excellent support, and apparently um, other police forces can um, connect uh, with respect to uh, advice around a potential human trafficking case. Uh, the last uh, resource there is West Coast Domestic Workers Association, and they are a Vancouver-based uh, NGO that assists um, live-in caregivers, temporary foreign workers uh, with a variety of legal issues including uh, human trafficking concerns. Uh, so now we would like to open it up. I'm sorry there's only about 10 minutes left for questions, um, but uh, we welcome any questions or comments that you have. And we're getting some uh, both uh, via the link function. And we'll uh, just turn it over to Larissa. I think there's a couple questions for her. Hi. So I can see that Andrea Dupont has uh, submitted a question. Do we work with Children's Street Society? And yes, both of our agencies work with Children's Street extensively. Um, they do excellent work throughout the province. For those of you that aren't aware, um, they are a nonprofit agency that's provincial who provides um, education and early intervention um, programming for uh, youth around the issue of sexual exploitation. And they deliver these programs throughout the province and uh, do it in a very creative, excellent way in a youth talking to youth model and you can request a presentation from them just by going through their website children of the street they're a very important partner for all of us to work with as we look at the full spectrum of this issue and working with sexually exploited youth um, I also see from Lindsay there um, is a question in the case that there is illegal, an illegal immigrant and she is being exploited in the interior and is eligible for social develop is she eligible for social development or benefits while they're doing the police investigation so I would say in general, there are some resources we would look at. I can't confirm yes or no, but in terms of if this is a case of exploitation and there's some indicators of trafficking um, and they have no status, the first step would be to look at the VTIP TRP, the Victim of Trafficking in Persons Temporary Resident Permit. Um, and if she is eligible for that, it provides 180 days and can be renewed. And it provides um, income assistance, a work permit, and some level of medical coverage as well. Um, they aren't always the easiest to get. There is a very specific criteria, but that would probably be the first step um, in terms of assisting that person. Um, if they do not have status of any kind, um, then in terms of uh, things like income assistance, uh, there is definitely challenges around that. I haven't had a lot of cases where they've been able to access that without having some level of status, even if that's applied status, meaning they have applied for um, something like a temporary resident permit or a humanitarian and compassion application um, uh, for permanent residency. So during the police investigation, that's usually a key piece is to go um, and to take a look at the VTIP TRP. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Those are great questions. The uh, first question you asked about the uh, legal supports for someone who uh, does not have status, um, that's where West Coast Domestic Workers Association would be an excellent um, place for you to contact and uh, they are um, one of the contacts we list uh, in the PowerPoint and they are a legal uh, support service for temporary foreign workers, live-in caregivers and others without status in Canada. So they're very familiar with uh, the Immigration Act and uh, the various forms of, um, of status that, uh, that, you know, and the various options. So it's, uh, it's really important to connect with, um, with them or with an immigration lawyer that can explain the various options to, uh, to someone. Uh, the second question you mentioned had to do with uh, safety. And um, I think that's really uh, very important. And of course, you as an agency would have um, safety protocols uh, that you know you would need to um, ensure are in place for um, for any person that you're you're assisting. Um, but the, um, the 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 advantage of um, Larissa's uh, service is that they provide an extremely um, you know high security, very safe. Uh, environment. Uh, you do need to, um, you know, plan with the traffic person uh, a safety protocol and plan, and those can look um, very different. I would suggest you look in the online training again for some more specific uh, information uh, about that. Could, could we just move to one? Sorry. It's very challenging, you're right, especially for um, those male victims of, of human trafficking. And please call our office or, um, or Larissa if, if that's a situation that uh, you face. We may be able to uh, assist with some uh, contacts. There's certainly nothing like uh, Deborah's Gate for male victims of trafficking, but we've, we've certainly come across them uh, in, uh, in the work that we do. And, uh, and there are um, sometimes, uh, you know, some s services through South Salvation Army or through some of the refugee uh, houses that um, that we can uh, access. So, um, you know, please call us. That's part of our job here at the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons, and and also uh, Larissa's mandate is to try to uh, provide outreach and troubleshoot and, and give you some options for uh, for where you can help uh, your clients connect to. Thank you. Uh, a question from Michelle Lung, and Michelle says, I've heard of some cases where young women have been used for the transport of drugs. Some of these transportation methods include ingesting large amounts of drugs that are stored in small packages. Does this fall into the definition of trafficked persons as well? Well, one of the things I would say is that we've actually seen this a lot as well, where young women, especially if there's gang involvement, have been used as drug mules. So they have either picked up and dropped off drugs, or in cases like this, I haven't seen one particularly with ingestion, but they've had to carry a large amount of drugs on them. Uh, it really depends on the circumstance in terms of whether that's trafficking or even just general exploitation um, and what components of labor or trafficking are involved in that. Um, I would leave kind of really defining the criminal components to the police, but what I would say is that um, if there is a component of forced labor, so that person is forced and being controlled, yeah, there are definitely components of trafficking. And if there also is any components of sexual exploitation, um, that essentially uh, would fall right into what some of the trends that we're seeing in BC. Um, one of the things that you'll, you'll note, and we've talked about, is that a lot of these cases are complex, so it often means um, doing a bit of case, case consulting with other individuals who work in the field, or if the person you're working with wants to connect to police, bringing the police, um, specifically the units like the counter-exploitation unit through the Vancouver Police Department, to troubleshoot a bit with them um, to kind of assess what's going on and what supports and interventions can be made. 
Is there any other questions? Yeah, we've got just a minute or two here, so we can take one or two more. There was a question that um, had to do with the, this one, very, there's a fine line between culturally accepted practices and some trafficking signs. I feel confused. Uh, yes, this is a, um, uh, a difficult area. I think we, we need to be guided by the, uh, the protocol and, and in Canada we have the uh, offenses of human trafficking in the criminal code and the uh, Immigration Act and, uh, and those are what guides us in terms of whether or not something uh, will be, you know, uh, prosecuted as human trafficking. Um, and, and certainly we need to support uh, all victims that are being controlled and exploited for labor or sexual services or a combination uh, of both. So I think that uh, concludes our session today. Uh, I want to thank Larissa Maxwell very much for participating with me and for all of you uh, in joining us today. I hope uh, we've been able to provide a little bit of uh, clarity around this, uh, this very difficult issue and uh, please don't hesitate to call us if you have any questions at all uh, and uh, my direct line is, um, is mentioned there as well as uh, our, uh, our website and our, our email. So I look forward to hearing from you and thank you very much again.